Hello, uh, welcome to this um, short video about identity. I'm going to look at uh, social class identity. And with social class identity, um, we can say first of all that with any type of identity, because we primarily argue that identity is formed in relation to culture and groups and institutions and agencies of control and socialization, we can talk about norms, values, status and roles. So with class and class culture, we can talk about class identity having two main sides to it, first of all. It has uh, material factors and non-material factors which explain class identity. So material factors are often seen as more objective measures of class identity. Economic factors are seen as objective measures of class identity, of material objective measures of class identity, economic factors like income and wealth. Um, and obviously that gives you an identity in terms of occupational income and wealth and property that is likely to give you a definition in terms of whether you're part of what could be called an underclass, long-term unemployed, poverty, working class, uh, manual labour occupations, uh, lower incomes historically, um, lower capital and wealth, middle class more of that, upper class more of that again, the wealthy. And also you can t talk about cultural and social um, non-material factors of social class which are cultural and social factors. So you could talk about this in terms of um, types of capital, like cultural capital and social capital. Um, you could talk about norms and values, you could talk about lifestyle. And so here we could talk about the underclass in terms of often being characterised or de you know, described as having uh, a lack of values, um, having an immoral response to poverty, um, having um, no involvement in the economic labour market and not wishing to, not valuing work and not valuing education. Um, the working class, they tend to be seen as having values based around collectivism, as a focus on um, support in the community and solidarity, togetherness in the community with the working class. It's a study by Lockwood. David Lockwood looked at um, a, a, the working class community where he said there was a long history and tradition of working class work. People in, the, in that community all did the same kind of jobs and they had a culture of collectivism. They worked together and they, they had leisure time together. And also a sense of fatalism sense that life is out of your control and so life is hard and, and you have to kind of work hard to survive and an instrumental attitude to work so instrumentalism is essentially that work is a means to an end it's a tool it's not an end in itself so you work to live you don't live to work um, and obviously that's been studied because the middle class have a more privatized values, sense of being an individual, an individual family. Margaret Thatcher said there's no such thing as society and individualism could now be said to be part of our culture more than collectivism. Um, the middle class want to move up, want, 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 want to achieve mobility, social mobility for themselves. And um, so studies like Goldthorpe's study found that there was fragmentation of the class system from a Weberian perspective where um, people were in a different class group than before. He was trying to find out if they're becoming more middle class from the working class. And the upper class values, probably based on a sense of deference, the idea that they should be deferred to, um, that they might be um, proud of their ancestry, um, they might have rank and property 
uh, and a pride in their property. And they might have different types of economic, cultural and social capital in the middle and upper class. Cultural capital, what we know, and social capital, who we know. So cultural capital is to do with knowledge and skills and education, tastes in the arts, tastes and preferences in terms of literature and food is seen as um, tasteful. And who we know, social capital, connections and networks, people that, that um, might benefit you, um, such as in institutions like schools, knowing the teachers, knowing members of that system and so on. The study of the culture of each class group has been focused on by sociologists because it's important from their perspective to see whether there is a coherent class identity or whether that's fragmenting. The functionalists argue that class is clear, clearly alive and well. They argue it's a meritocratic, that the, that the um, class system is meritocratic, um, that your role and status is based on your ability and effort. Um, there's also the concept of mutual reciprocity um, the idea that each group benefits from the other. So every group benefits and depends on the other. So interdependence. Um, so managers depend on workers to carry out the plans. The workers depend on the managers to give them plans. Each group depends on the others for, for work. Uh, and there's an overall consensus that all of us agree with the class system. The functionists believe that people generally agree with the class system. They want leaders who are more hard-working and intelligent. Um, they think that rewards are, are basically deserved. Um, and the new right perspective on social class is that identities have become fragmented. There's a lack of consensus. The new right are really neo-functionalists, so they agree with the idea about consensus being important. Functionists and new rights share this idea about human beings being selfish. Humans need to be kept in a state of fear so that they'll be controlled and, and not be selfish. Um, but the new right are concerned that there's, there's a loss of control. The control has been lost and so um, there's this underclass at the bottom of society. The underclass is a result of an overgenerous welfare state and a lack of control from, from the state to control crime, partially enough. Um, the idea of there being a, a clear consensus, um, you can see in contemporary society that there is um, social mobility to support the point about meritocracy. Saunders, Peter Saunders, did a study where he says uh, society is unequal but fair. And he points out that absolute mobility is a reality. So people have been mobile overall across the whole society. Um, the theorists that tend to disagree with the functionists and you write about class identity would be the theorists who come under what we call the social advantages and disadvantages thesis, which is essentially saying that some groups are, are benefiting from their background and some groups are disadvantaged or, or held back because of their background. Um, and so this essentially saying it's not a fair system, it's not based on merit, it's not based on ability, it's not based on effort. And this would be supported by Marxists who argue that the class system is um, unfair, it's exploitative because the capitalist system involves economic power at the top um, and a hardening of class inequalities and the polarisation between the rich and poor. Um, Westergaard and Ressler said that there was a hardening of class inequalities during the 1980s. Um, so they might point to statistics like in politics and education, 14% of the population independently educated or educated at private fee paying schools and yet 59% of Conservative MPs are privately come from private school backgrounds. So that suggests that um, there's an overrepresentation of privately schooled um, 
people in the uh, political system. Um, of course, that can be discussed in different ways. The Marxists would put it down to barriers, class prejudice, and discrimination. The Functionists would put it down to merit. People like Saunders argue people are becoming less intelligent. The reason for those at the top having more status is because they're more intelligent. Um, Weberians like Goldthorpe see the position, the divisions in the labour market as becoming more fragmented because of rationalisation and bureaucratisation. Um, Goldthorpe looked at the embourgeoisement thesis to find out whether class identities were changing, see if the working class were becoming like more like the middle class in their identities and lifestyle. And he found that they're becoming a new working class. They had privatised families and more privatised lives, but they still had a kind of sense of, of collectivism and, and um, sense of community as well. Um, the neo-Marxists, like the Weberians, argue that there's fragmentation in the uh, class system, but they still emphasise economic factors and, and ownership uh, fundamentally. Um, Pierre Bourdieu supports the neo-Marxist position because he talks about types of capital. So he says, you know, middle class may have more cultural capital and they might be seen as um, tasteful in their lifestyle. Although economically they may have less economic capital than the new rich. Um, so there's this idea that the new rich might have less cultural capital but more economic capital. Um, Eric Wright talks about the contradictory class location of the middle class. He says they're not a real class because they're in this position where they have some characteristics of the upper class and some characteristics of the working class. They are the controllers and the exploiters in some ways. They might have share ownership and some level of, of management responsibility, but they're also on a salary and they can be fired, so they've got some aspects of the working class and vulnerability economically. So um, he acknowledges that they exist, but he doesn't really see them as a proper class in themselves. Um, looking at the underclass, um, Crane argues that the underclass is a rational response to poverty. The underclass aren't really homogenous. They're not a coherent group. They're heterogeneous. They are mixed and they tend to change. They don't stay in the underclass and they have values where they do value work. They don't want to be um, jobless. Um, criminality and um, benefit um, dependency is a rational response to poverty from his perspective. So that would be supported by a Marxist and Weberian position. Um, the new right thinkers argue that, um, that this is wrong, that the, the underclass are an undeserving poor. They're, they sh they're undeserving because they're immoral and their response to poverty is wrong and it should be punished and not rewarded. Um, the social action theorists have talked about the labelling of different class groups. For example, representations in the media of different class groups, like the programme Shameless, we talk about media portrayals and representations of an underclass uh, and a sense of um, leisure and crime. Um, and the idea of kind of dirty, unhygienic, um, problematic behaviour and identities. This is supported by a study by uh, Jock Young, who studied hippies in Notting Hill, where they were labelled by the news of the world as dirty and promiscuous and drug takers. And um, the police targeting of the hippies actually amplified their deviance. So the argument is that the labelling of class groups based on identities may actually increase difference and division. The postmodernists, some argue class is dead. Um, some argue that there's just greater individualisation and choice. Um, so there's choice and change in the class structure. Um, Polemus talks about consumption and a cultural supermarket of styles where um, people are able to choose their um, social status based on consumption rather than being limited by their occupation. Pakulski and Waters argue that class is dead, that other non-economic factors like uh, the uh, issues of age and ethnicity are more important than class in forming identity. Um, Jacques Lyotard argues that um, 
the media has an increasing influence on identity, which suggests that the workplace is less important. And the grand narratives, the big theories like postmodern, like um, functionalists and Marxists, are outdated because there's so much change.